Well, we are uh, in the middle of a, uh, or I'm sorry, at the end of uh, the series that we uh, started, The Christian in Prayer. The, the exciting uh, conclusion to the trilogy of The Christian in Prayer. Uh, and we're going to answer a question on how does God answer prayer? And we uh, have already looked at a few different uh, questions. Uh, who can pray? Why do we pray? When do we pray? Where do we pray? How should we pray? And to whom we should pray? And then moved on into some areas that, uh, that we prayed. That was the last time we, we uh, talked about prayer. Uh, focusing on uh, areas like uh, worship, like we're doing tonight. Uh, when we're being thankful to God. And when we are, are confessing our sins to Him. When we are petitioning or are asking Him for something uh, for ourselves. And then also the fact that uh, as Christians we also have the ability to intercede for others. And so these are just some of the areas that we get to pray to God about. All these, again, uh, focusing on the fact that uh, we want communication with God. Uh, we want to be able to, to talk, talk to Him. Uh, we know He talks to us through the Scriptures. And uh, we are able to, uh, to have this uh, relationship building skill, this idea of, of communication. But when we talk to Him, the question is, you know, how, how does God answer those prayers? When we are, are pouring out our hearts uh, and, and petitioning Him for something for ourselves or, or we are praying for others as we've already done tonight, how does He answer that? Well, first, we get to uh, start off with, yes, that God answers prayer. And it's just absolutely amazing to me that uh, we can say that. Knowing uh, what we've studied with uh, God creating the heavens and the earth, I mean, the creator of the entire universe. And uh, he hears me. Uh, he hears when I pray. And he answers when I pray. And what an awesome feeling that is to know that uh, we have the ear of Almighty God. And uh, since man has been around, and since man has uh, created different beings in, the, in their mind and uh, created all these gods uh, over the years and centuries, uh, people have been praying to uh, false gods. People have been praying to, uh, to you know, false ways, and hoping to have an answer, even sometimes believing completely uh, that there is an answer there to someone who does not exist. Thankfully, we can see proof all around us, of course, that God does exist. And through his word, he has told us that he will listen and he will answer. And so uh, we've uh, been talking to God since the beginning. But we look at uh, Psalm 17, verse 6. Uh, I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. And it depends on, of course, how you read this. Uh, this is not a demanding, listen, God, you're going to listen to me. <laughs> Lean your ear over this way. And listen to what I'm telling you. Uh, this is more of a um, request. God, please listen to me. Lean your ear towards me. I, I'm going to talk, and I, I want you to, to listen to me. And the psalmist can write that because he knew that God was going to listen. Show your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand, O oh, you who save those who trust in you from those who rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me from my deadly enemies who surround me. We as uh, children of God, uh, we are fighting for the affection of our Father. Thankfully, we can all say we're the favorite. I'm the apple of my Father's eye. And of course, anybody else who's... Uh, called me, or I, or even you, can make that same claim. God, in His uh, infinite ability, uh, is also able to uh, play favorites with all of us. We're all a favor. He loved every single one of us enough to send Jesus for us specifically. That's a lot of love, and He's got it, and He's given it. Psalm 4, verse 1, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Time and time again over the centuries, man has asked God to hear. Thankfully, he has answered, yes, I will uh, I will hear. And 
and yes, I will answer. Psalm 91, verse 14, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Yes, God answers prayer. We see God answering prayer with uh, Elijah, which the, uh, the showdown with the prophet of Bell, one of my, one of my favorite stories, uh, mainly because Elijah is a little smart aleck and, and, and I chuckle every time I read it. But uh, also we see the tremendous power of prayer. Elijah prayed to God and he answered. Here, this is uh, this showdown with uh, the prophets of Baal. It should have been uh, just uh, no competition at all. The competition, what, let's see, let's ask our gods, Baal and Jehovah, to send fire down and light up this altar. And that should have been a walk in the park for Baal. Part of his uh, great power, you know, something like Zeus, uh, when the lightning goes, he was supposed to be able to, uh, to throw a lightning around. He had a, a hammer in one hand, he had a stick in another, and he would hit the end of that stick. All right, Lightning would come out, and every time that he hit that stick, of course, then the thunder came. So this was just right in his wheelhouse, if he was actually real. So it should have been just no competition at all for Baal to light up an altar. And so there's the challenge. And amazingly enough, since he wasn't real, and still is not real, the altar did not get built up that they had set aside in the bell. Of course, as we know, Elijah set up the altar for, for God to light and made it uh, extremely difficult to light with, with fire. Uh, just to douse the douse the, the wood and the offering and the stones, it just uh, had just water, uh, just time after time poured on there. It was just, just drenched with water. In 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, verse number 36. It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Elijah prayed. The Lord answered. We talked about Hannah praying in the temple. God answered uh, Hannah's prayer. Of course, He didn't send fire down from uh, the sky when He answered His prayer. But it was still something that was uh, miraculous. She was not able to have children. Until God said, Hannah, you can have children. And that is exactly what she was asking. God answered her prayer for the child. King Hezekiah uh, received a letter from the king of Assyria bragging about uh, what he had been doing lately. Just taking on other nations, fighting them and winning taking on the other nations and their gods, their puny little gods that couldn't stand up to him, the king of uh, Assyria. And he was going to uh, show up and visit Hezekiah and take on this little god that he's got called Jehovah. <coughs> he's just another god. I'm going to take care of him and uh, your nation just like I did all the others. Hezekiah takes this letter that he gets from the king, spreads it out before God. And Isaiah 37, verse 14, Hezekiah received this letter from the hand of the messengers, read it. Hezekiah went to the house of the Lord, spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God. You alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, Lord our God, 
Save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, and you alone. Reminding God, you know, the, the, all these fake gods, since they didn't exist, they couldn't stand up to Sennacherib. But since we know you're real, you're the only God, you're the creator of the entire universe, how about show the rest of the world who you are? Stand up to this army. So Isaiah answers Hezekiah in verses 21 to 35, and then God shows his answer in verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained in heaven. Which is only for just a little while that he left the <coughs> compliments of his children. But here we have an answer from God. God, can you take on his army for us? Okay, I'll send an angel. We sing the song, uh, you know, we could have called 10,000 angels. He, he was actually called it, you know, said he could have called it 12 legions of angels. Well, look at what one can do. It took on an entire army, 185,000 soldiers. They didn't stand a chance. That was God answering the request. God answered the prayer of Jesus. There he was in the garden, praying for what was about to happen. His death on the cross and all that happened before. If there was any other way, God, can we do it another way? Of course, his prayer was, not my will, but thine be done. And God answered his prayer. Of course, just a few pages later, we see Jesus dying on the cross. So how, how can we say God answered his prayer if he was dying on the cross, doing exactly the thing that he was asking God to take away. Well, let's look at how God answers prayer. It depends on who you ask or who you're reading. Uh, you know, God answers prayer in these seven ways, or these five ways. Uh, we're just going to go with three, because I, you know, I, I can't remember too much. If I go to the grocery store, it's got to be three things. So we'll, just, we'll do three things, just, just to kind of keep it uh, you know, so small for me. All right? So, God answers prayer in three ways. The first answer is uh, yes. You can probably go ahead and guess the second. But don't, don't answer yet. Uh, we'll, we'll come up with that one in just a minute. Again, Hezekiah prayed to God. He was sick. He was dying. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse number 1. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Here are the word. Of, this is coming from God. You need to make sure everything is ready to go. You're not going to make it very much longer. That's uh, a little more powerful than words coming from a doctor. This is uh, the one that knows everything. Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Pay attention to the prayer. Lord, remember me. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court, and the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return. And tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, surely I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days fifteen years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Syria, and I will defend this city for my own sake, and for the sake of my servant David. Hezekiah's prayer I'm going to say much better than expected. We don't really know exactly what he expected. <coughs> because his prayer was, God, remember me. <coughs> and the word of the Lord came 
impact that you're going to get, not only healing, you're going you're gonna to be well. You were this close to dying, but I'm going to heal you, and you're going to have another 15 years of life. I will defend you. I will defend the city. God is able to answer prayers in a way that is way more than we can ask, than, than we can think of, than we can ever conceive. Because He is almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, and He really loves us. Paul was trying to explain that to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 3, verse 20, and that to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. We have an amazing God. The fact that He can do something like uh, provide eternal life is absolutely amazing. And that's just in the time to come. The things that we've looked at so far are the things in this life now. What blessings we have received in this life. All because we serve an amazing God. God answers prayer in three ways. You probably guessed uh, if the first answer was yes, the second answer would probably be no. You are correct. We look at Elijah. After the showdown. I mean, this, you know, we talk about a roller coaster ride. Uh, there's an echo. Sorry. I hear that uh, in my ear. You talk about a roller coaster right here. He is, he is defeated the prophets of Baal. The prophets of Baal don't make it. They are all killed because they, they lose. And uh, all of a sudden, Elijah figures out that uh, Jezebel is after him. She promises that uh, he's going to end up the same as those prophets of Baal. And so he uh, gets out of town in a hurry. 1 Kings uh, chapter 19, verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also, how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that he arose, ran for his life, went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left the servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he prayed that he might die. And said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Here he was praying to God, asking him, Okay, I, that, that's it. it. It's enough. Just take my life now. God answered, No. Now, we didn't hear this uh, you know, loud booing, No! You know, this voice from above. But he was strengthened by the Lord. Provided for because he still had work to do. And then, the amazing thing is, is after uh, Elijah asked to have his life taken from him, God answers no again. And yeah, not, not with this uh, loud, booming voice and saying, you know that question you asked before, I'm going to say no again. Just watch this. But we see it. Elijah and Elisha are out walking. 2 Kings 2, verse 11. And then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. His life was not ended. His time on this earth was ended. He was taken. The Apostle Paul asked three times to have this thorn in the flesh removed. He told the church in Corinth, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, uh, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that I might part from it. I mean, you talk about somebody that's got a really, really good connection with God. The Apostle Paul. An amazing soldier 
in the Lord's army. He pleaded with God three times, get rid of this. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, and needs, and persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Say, Father, God answers prayer in three ways. Yes, no, wait. Maybe we're asking for something that is totally legit. This is exactly what we need to be asking for. But maybe God has decided that the timing is not exactly right. There are some who are just praying to God constantly and asking for this. This is I, I absolutely know this is the right thing. I, I must have this right now. And get mad at God because it doesn't happen. Surely he sees what I'm asking. Surely he knows I need this. Do we have enough faith in God to wait on him? We as, uh, as man don't need to think ourselves uh, smarter than God and know exactly what we need. If there's anybody that knows anything, it is Almighty God. We may not comprehend everything he sees before, during, and after. He's got a much better view of life than we do. Foolishness of God is wiser than man. Even God in his dumbest days, even though he doesn't have any, because he's all powerful, all knowing. But even the, the, the foolishness of God is wiser than man. That's how smart God is compared to us. See, man's pretty smart. He's put a man on the moon. Or in a movie theater or a movie sound set. You know, depends on which story you read. But we can, we can go, we can send objects into space, we can cure diseases, we can, we can do some amazing things. God created the entire universe out of absolutely nothing. We're still, we're still trying to get up to, to his level. Do we trust Almighty God enough to work on His time schedule versus ours? We sing the song that teach me, Lord, to wait. We're asking for patience. We're asking for God to teach us patience. Sometimes that's a difficult lesson. But it is one that is needed. If we are waiting on that answer from God and still trusting in Him to deliver the right answer because we know whatever the answer is, it's going to be right. Our faith is able to grow. That. Trusting in Him to give us the answer that best suits us, that is the best for us in our life and our growth as Christians. As we have our faith tested, it produces endurance. It increases our faith. The more and more we're able to use it, the more and more we're able to count. As, uh, as parents, those of us that are parents, we know that uh, as we make decisions with our children, the idea is we're making these decisions based on what is going to work out best for them. The home is a training ground. We are raising these beings who are going to be adults on their own, making their own decisions one day. I know, it, it, it gets scary. But they are going to be on their own. They are going to face situations where 
they have to reach back into their mind and say, have I faced this decision before? Okay, if not, then maybe, or are there some principles that are, that are in my mind that can help me make this decision and make it correctly? And so sometimes when we make our decisions on something, They may not understand exactly where we're coming from. We may have to tell them no. And they really, really, really want your yes. Let me try, as parents, to know best. I know this is going to come as a shock to uh, children, but sometimes, even as parents, gathering up all the information we can about certain topics and, and the decisions we made, sometimes yes, we make the wrong decision. We'll let you know when that happens. Uh, you don't get to pick and choose as children when that uh, was a bad decision. But even with the best of intentions, and this is the decision that we, we were trying to, to get them to grow in the right direction, sometimes we may mess up. Sometimes parents might uh, not want to hurt their children's feelings. Sometimes parents make a decision based on, I really don't want to deal with the aftermath of this decision right now going against them, so I'm willing to make this decision instead. But our father. He's back in the house. He is 100% of the time giving us the right answer that helps us as his children when we ask. When we petition for ourselves, when we are interceding for others, when we are pleading with him to listen to us, give me this, he is going to answer us correctly. Even if it's yes, no, or wait a little while. He is always going to give us what we need. Not necessarily what we want. And I think we can see the world today and see this, uh, you know, this generation and this uh, giving children only what they want and not what they need to see how bad that can be for man. God's already on top of that lesson. God already knows that we need to hear what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. Are we willing to listen? Do we have enough faith in Him to trust Him to give us the right answer? One of the things we're looking for is that uh, opportunity to live eternally in heaven. There are many people who ask God to allow them to enter into heaven. There are many people who ask God for access to freedom from sin. And there are many people who ask to do it their way. Maybe do it the way that their, their parents taught them. The way that they heard on TV. Maybe read the book. And then God answers. And some people think that what we read in here, that just can't be right. God has answered how to obey the gospel. God has answered how to be free from sin. God has answered how to live eternally in heaven with him. It all started on the cross with his son died. See, there are those who are complete atheists, don't believe in God, and they just look at us as Christians and think, how can some guy dying on a cross 2,000 years ago help me today in 2017 live forever in this place that I can't see and just live on and on and on? That's crazy. 
but to us who are being saved. It's all about the power of God. We see proof after proof of His existence and His revealed will for us and His answer to us when we look to Him to help us. Tonight you have an opportunity to listen to the answer of God. When it uh, comes to the question, what must I do to be saved? It starts with the learning about Jesus and about that, that cross that uh, a lot of the world thinks is foolish. Learning that He is the Son of God. And then we'll be willing to change our life, to repent. In 13.3, Jesus says if we don't repent, if there is not a change in our life, we're going to perish. And then confessing our belief in Him, Matthew 10.32, we'll confess Him before men, He will confess us before God in heaven. And then being baptized and have our sins washed away, Acts 22.16, just as Saul did. When Ananias came in and told him to rise and be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And then living that, that uh, new life that he talks, uh, Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6. Coming up out of the water, leaving that old life behind, that new creature, that new life. Maybe you've, uh, you've done that and the new life uh, went back to an old life. Or maybe it's a new bad life. It's a life that has led you away from the will of God. Why not uh, come back to him tonight again? It, it starts with the cross. Because Jesus died on the cross, he shed his blood. We have access to God as Christians. He is willing to forgive us our sins. We'll ask. As we talked about before, you know, God doesn't hear the prayer of sinners. Except those who are coming after him, looking diligently to be able to come to him. He knows when we're praying. We're asking for forgiveness. Why not? Have him lean his ear towards you tonight. He is waiting to hear a prayer from you. Confessing your sin. Being willing to repent. And asking him for forgiveness. He is willing to answer yes. If we can help you anyway, let's understand something.